out there in no man's land, out there in potential, there's threat and, and, and like mortal threat, but there's also endless opportunity and riches and wealth and, and, and the possibility of attracting someone and all of that. And so, well, the dragon, you can't just be afraid of it, you just stay in your burrow the whole time. And lots of animals more or less do that, you know, they, especially the nocturnal ones, they just hide away. But that isn't what human beings are like, because we're not only prey animals, right? We're also predators, and then of course we're crazy, we're absolutely insane chimpanzees, right? We're crazy, and so we're always out there mucking about with things, and with our, you know, fingers, and, and our thumbs, and, and taking the world apart, and putting it back together, and uh, we're crazily exploratory, and, and, and troublemaking, and so we don't just run from dragons, we go hunt them down, and so... And so there's a story here, there's the oldest story that mankind knows, and literally it is the oldest story that we know, is this story. And the story basically is, there's a bounded space, a walled garden, a walled city, you know, and all the original cities were walled, because if they weren't, barbarians would swoop in, and, and they'd just steal all your stuff, and so, you know, that was kind of pointless. So, you know, you wanted to have some major league walls surrounding your territory, and so that's inhabited space, and inside that is your little dominance hierarchy. And so all you primates knew exactly who was who inside that space, so you didn't have to fight with each other, and you could predict each other's behavior because you believed the same things, and saw the world roughly the same way, and acted the same way, and so you were sort of secure. But then, the problem is, is that that can always be breached. There's always something outside of it that's a danger, and so that's signified by this, this little creature here, this, this dragon. And that, that twirl in its tail is very common among dragons. It's actually it's actually a symbol, because you know, imagistic languages, imagistic symbols have a, a, an ancient language, and it, 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 it's, it's referring to something that's basically eternal. And see, it lives down here in this, in this cave, because it's an underground thing. It's an underground thing, and you can kind of imagine what that's like, and sometimes this happens in initiation rituals among archaic people. They're gonna, when they're going to initiate, usually the young men, because nature initiates women all by itself, um, usually the young men, Maybe they'll put them in a cave and leave them there, you know, for like, well, who, lo who knows how long. And so you've got to think, what's in a cave? Now, caves are dark, man. I don't know if you've ever been in one, but like they're dark and they're really dark. And so not only is there whatever there is in the cave, and you don't know what the hell's in the cave, there's whatever you imagine might be in the cave. And so when you're in that cave and you're alone, you, you're confronting the devils and demons and monsters of your own imagination, you know. And so then you have a chance to perhaps deal with that and overcome it, and that's perhaps part of the initiation ceremony, you know, and that's part of growing up, because you have to learn how to face the things that terrify and upset you, and, and recast them and put them back together. We talked a little bit about this idea of the pre-cosmogonic chaos that, um, that uh, Iliad refers to, and, and that's the stuff out of which order is produced at the beginning of time, and it's also the stuff out of which you constantly reproduce order. And the, the Jungians, the psychoanalysts, especially the, the really deep psychoanalysts like Jung, Freud was a more surface psychoanalyst, and that's not an insult. There's some things that Freud figured out that are absolutely amazing. He was a precursor to Jung for sure. For Jung, the hero's journey was the journey inside the unconscious, and that would be perhaps in some sense the, 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 the willingness to face everything terrible that's happened to you and to think it through and to articulate it and, and to come to grips perhaps with your own capacity for malevolence. That was a really important part of Jungian ideas. That the first step towards individuation, which is the manifestation of your full self, let's say, was the discovery of your shadow. And your shadow is the part of you that will do terrible things under the right circumstances and maybe even without that much provocation. And, you know, and it's a terrifying part of you to come into contact with because it's sort of, it's sort of the way that you're specifically attached to the archetype of evil. That's a that's a good way of thinking about it. And you know, modern people they don't really think much about think much about the idea of good and evil. But that's because the most of them are so damn naive. You can just barely even comprehend it. You know, if you read any history, if you really read it, like, and you and you don't come away with the idea that evil exists. It's like you're just reading the wrong kind of history, you know. It's just unbelievable what people can do to each other. And we're so imaginative, you know. And one of the things I figured out about people, the reason that we're 
we have the knowledge of good and evil, let's say, is that because we're self-conscious and we know about ourselves, we, we know about our own vulnerability, right? You know what hurts you. You really know what hurts you, way more than an animal knows. And so, and you're also creative, and so once you know what hurts you, man, you can really hurt someone else. And you can do it in such a creative way, you can draw it out, you can make it excruciating, you can take people apart physically and psychologically, and you can keep them, say, even right on the edge of death, so that you can keep doing that endlessly. And, you know, that happens, hell of a lot more than you think it happens, it happens a lot. And so, well, and you think, well, you know, that doesn't involve me. It's like, oh yes it does, man, that's the problem, because, you know, you're human, and that's the sort of things that human beings are capable of. And I'm not saying you're all, it's all probable that you do that ever, or, or that, but I'm saying that, you know, you got to take that into account. When you're looking at the world and you think about all the perpetrators out there, it's like, it's not like there's perpetrators and there's victims. That isn't how it works. It doesn't work that way at all, and so the horrors of humanity, as well as the noble elements of humanity, are all elements of your central being. And for Jung, and this is the terrible thing, for Jung, the pathway to higher wisdom was through the terrible portal of, well, you could say hell, for that matter. Really? And, and so who wants to do that, man? It's like, no. You know, like, maybe you're resentful about something. Well, you probably are, because, like, everybody's resentful about something, you know? And resentment is just a vicious emotion. It's really useful. It's really useful, because if you're resentful about something, it either means that you should grow the hell up and accept the responsibility and quit sniveling around and whining, or it means that someone actually is oppressing you and, and pushing on you too hard and bullying you and demeaning you, and you have something to say or do that you're not saying or doing. And no wonder you're not saying or doing it, because, you know, it can be really dangerous to say things or do them to free yourself from, from being oppressed. You can get in a lot of trouble in the short term for doing it, so it's easier just to not say anything, sort of day after day. In the short term you protect yourself, but it just crushes you. And then the, the resentment comes up, and resentment, man, that can just get so out of hand, you know. It starts with resentment, and then it starts, it, it goes to the desire for revenge, you know, because you'll play nasty little tricks on the person that's oppressing you. At any chance, you'll talk about them behind their back, and if they want you to do something, you'll do it badly, or you'll do it grudgingly, or you'll do a half-rate job, and you'll set up little traps, and, you know, so it puts you in a poisonous space, and then if that, if you really start to dwell on that, say, in your basement for three or four years about just exactly how terrible the world is and how that's focused on you and how everyone's rejected you and how you get to this point where you're thinking that you know existence itself is a kind of poisonous endeavor and that the best thing for you to do is go out there and do as much you know create as much mayhem as you possibly can and if you really get to a dark place you think I'm gonna create as much mayhem as I possibly can by targeting the most innocent thing I can possibly imagine and so that's a bad road, man. There's dark things down there. But you can go there, and people do. And they go through the hole of resentment. And so, resentment can tell you, you've got something to say. You bloody well better say it. You gotta free yourself from what's oppressing you. You have to stand up for that, because otherwise, you become oppressed. And then once you're oppressed, that's just not so good. And so, like in your marriage, in your relationships, you got to tell people what you're thinking. You don't have to assume you're right. That's a whole different story, because you're not, because you're, you know, ignorant, and you're biased, and, you know. So you're not right, but you can stumble towards your, this, the expression of yourself, and then you can listen to the other person, and hope that they tell you some way that you're stupid that's useful, so you can be a little less stupid in the future, because that, wouldn't that be good? And so, you know, you go after the unknown, you don't protect what you know, you already know what you know. You go after... Thank you.
don't know. That's why you have to talk to people you don't agree with. That's why you have to talk to your enemies. Because they're going to tell you things you don't know. You could even listen to them. It's possible they know a thing or two you don't know. But people don't like that, you know. They just talk to people who think the same way. And then they just stay stupid. And so that's, and that's not good. Because if you're not wise, the world will wallop you. It'll flatten you. And, and far more than it has to. And then you'll be bitter and resentful. And you'll be part of that force that wallops instead of the force that fights against that. So, well, so you go after the dragon and that's what, that's what this guy is doing. He's going after the dragon. It's, it's threatening the society because it always does. Ch ch chaos, what's outside of order always threatens order. Always. Always. And so you have to step forward, you know, in this manner, voluntarily. And, 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 and go after that when it's still manageable. Right? And that's the case in your own life, too. So, you know, if, you're, if you've had a proclivity to be bullied in the past, you know, and you want to get out of that, what you have to do is you have to make yourself awake to the, to the, to the, to the, to the what would you say, to the, to the initial stages of that sort of bullying emerging in your life again, that sort of domination, and you have to step forward against it when it's still in its developing stages, because maybe you can just not have it happen. That would be better. And so you have to be ready to speak what you have to say, more or less on a moment's notice. You, you can't be impulsive about it. You know, like if you and I are talking and you make a mistake or I make a mistake, even if it bothers one or the other of us, we should just write it off because it's like one encounter. What the hell? You, you know, maybe we had a bad night's sleep or something, you know? You, so you've got to be a little forgiving. And, but if it happens twice, then, you know, you should be a little awake. And you should remember both times. And then if it happens a third time, it's like that's when, you, that's when you act. And you say, look, we talked and this happened. And I thought, yeah, whatever. And th but then you did it again. And then you just did it again. Well, then the person is basically like, what are they going to do? You know, no. Well, maybe they might argue with you, but you kind of got them. And generally, if you just point that out to people, just like that, just that you noticed and are willing to say something about it, they'll back the hell off. They'll often apologize. And sometimes you even make them a little more conscious, which is like, hey, that's not such a bad idea. And that's what all this means. And so this, ca this chaos idea, it's, so for Jung, it was the unconscious, right? It was the contents of your unconscious. And so the unknown past, the threatening past that you have never dealt with, <clears throat> might be the threatening future. It might be the threatening present. But Jung realized as, his, as he got older that, that the unconscious was also the world. And you think, and so the chaos is not only your unconscious mind, which meets the unknown, but it's actually the unknown itself mingled together. And you think, what the hell does that part? That's why the dragon is a land creature and an air creature. It's matter and spirit at the same time. And this sort of gets us into constructivism. Because the constructivists think that basically what happens is that you encounter those elements of the world that don't fit into your theory. And out of those new elements you make the world through your perceptions and you make yourself by incorporating the information and transforming yourself. And that's how Piaget explains the development of a child. The child starts out with some reflexes, basic reflexes, and Manifesting the reflexes produces results in the world and then the child has to reorganize its perceptions to take into account the transformations and so then it, it gets a little more sophisticated and then it can do a few more things and then it can manifest more changes in the world and then it, mod it, it tracks them and modifies its perceptions and actions to account for them and it just keeps doing that and that's how the child boots itself up like a computer does.